Welcome to Channel and Mike. I'm Andy Liu in Washington, D.C. Huawei Technologies was founded in 1987 in southern China. Now it is the world's largest telecommunications equipment provider, serving over a third of the world's population in more than 140 countries, including the United States. Recent debates over cybersecurity have again put Huawei under the spotlight. Is Huawei doing good business? How are Huawei's practices affecting people here in the U.S.? And what does Huawei's growth mean for other Chinese multinational companies investing overseas? Recently, I talked to Huawei USA's Vice President for External Affairs, Mr. Bill Plummer. Now, let's listen to what he has to say. Whether you're a company like Huawei, or Ericsson, or Cisco, or Alcatel, Lucent, or Nokia, you're global. That's the upside of globalization. The potential downside is, is that we also all face common challenges. Um, we have global supply chains. Uh, we are conducting research and development and coding software in countries all over the world. So the concerns about the integrity of networks are very real but suggestions that they are somehow limited to certain geographies or companies with a heritage in a certain geography are, are very much distractions um, and they're politically driven. First statement, he said something to the effect of he believes or it is his opinion. Um, and those statements also were politically motivated. Now, Huawei understands that there are geopolitical issues that are far above and beyond us. We're a multinational company that's doing business globally. You have to put this in the context. Imagine roughly one third of the world's population is in some way or another connected by Huawei Solutions. We're doing 70% of our business outside of China. We're in over 150 markets, over 500 operator customers, national operators in virtually every OECD country except for one. It sort of exposes what is a geopolitical game that is being played and, and, and to some extent, you know, market access for Huawei in this market um, is a pawn on the U.S. side of the board. Um, you made reference to other markets. I think in the U.K. it's been a very pragmatic approach to concerns related to the integrity of networks. Um, and there's, there's, there's a benefit to taking a pragmatic approach. Um, there's a reason why Americans pay three times as much for their mobile broadband as do Europeans. There's a reason why Huawei invested an additional $2 billion in the UK last year when our CEO met with Prime Minister Cameron. There's a reason why Huawei will be doubling its employment in Europe to 15,000 in the next three years. There's a reason why we opened a new R&D center in Ireland at the end of last year and in Finland at the beginning of this year. Markets that are open to competition and take a pragmatic approach to security issues are markets that are going to benefit. But the approaches that we've heard from a political minority here in the US, you know, blackballing country companies by virtue of their, their geography of headquarters, that's not solve a problem in a world where every company building telecom gear is global and subject to the same common global vulnerabilities. We need to raise the bar for everyone. That is an, a pragmatic and effective approach which has been adopted and is being adopted in most markets. Although Huawei has a limited market share here in the U.S., it's not giving up this market due to its high strategic value. Seven out of Huawei's nearly 30 research and development centers are located here. The U.S. government has also grown more understanding of Chinese investors. Despite all the progress made, there seems to be more that Huawei needs to do to build trust with America. The U.S. has issues with China, and China has issues with the U.S. And 
to, and, and those issues are so broad and vast and, and, and far beyond a Huawei and far beyond even telecom. And we get caught up in the, the middle of that because we happen to have a heritage in China. But again, you have to, and, and part of this is, is helping, helping folks that are politically minded understand that a company like Huawei, we did $35 billion in, in business last year, globally. One third, well, 32% of our inputs into our solutions come from American suppliers. That was between six and a half and seven billion dollars in procurements last year. And so some of what we have to do here in this market is to help people understand that you actually, in taking, in, in, in erecting market access barriers to, which are not effective at addressing network security issues, you're actually hurting American companies and jobs. And that does resonate. But it's an education. It's an education process. It's helping. It's helping politicians primarily that don't necessarily have a grasp of the transnational nature of this industry understand exactly what what the industry looks like. Understand that a Cisco and an Alpha Lucent and an Ericsson and a Nokia Siemens are like Huawei, all conducting R and D globally, encoding software globally, and building product globally, and all in China. Three years ago, if the situation was much more black and white. Today, I think that there's a bit of, I don't speak Mandarin, but there's a bit of Huidu in the mix. The shades of gray are compelling people to look twice. It's like, oh, this isn't as simple as this and this. This is all mixed up in the middle. And so we can't simply cut something out and suggest that the, everything is going to be better. We need to have universal solutions because that's the only way to address what are universal vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. you know, at the beginning of the year, the President Obama issued his, his executive order on cyber, um, which was very pragmatic and focused on, on finding industry-wide solutions. It, it charged the National Institute of Standards and Technology to come up with a framework for supply chains. Um, we saw Secretary Kerry in the spring meeting with his counterparts in China, which, which led to the first of a, of a meeting between the two governments on cyber in July. Um, we've seen U.S. industry, uh, the Telecommunications Industry Association, the Information Technology Industry Council, the Software Industry Association, the Semiconductor Industry Association, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, all joining together this spring in letters to the Congress saying, these geographic barriers are a bad idea. Because it impacts them. It, they're all American companies and Chinese companies. And moreover, they don't want to see reciprocal type actions taken in other markets. Um, so the geopolitics is a thing that has existed, but now we're starting to see rational thought breaking out all over. A father of eight children, Bill Plummer served as a U.S. Foreign Service officer in Latin America and Europe for seven years and then with the European telecom giant Nokia for 12 years before he joined Huawei in 2010. When I asked Bill how much his unique profile helped Huawei's growth in the U.S., he then emphasized the company's open and engaging culture as the primary reason for its success. His point may well resonate with other Chinese multinationals as more and more of them are going out of China only to find themselves mired in controversies. Huawei today, or Huawei when I joined three years ago, three plus years ago, and still today, reminds me a lot of Nokia when I joined that company in 97. Um, it's young, it's vibrant. and. To some extent, that comes with some, you know, dysfunctionality is the wrong word. We've been growing so fast, we need to catch up in some ways. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the catching up is being better communicators. Um, when you're a global leader, communicating well is not an opportunity. It is an obligation. It is what is expected of you. And Communicating takes bravery. Um, it is different in different cultures. Communicating can be, whereas you know, Americans tend to be very loud and brash and, 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 and 
we're all about communicating and branding and marketing. That's not necessarily the same in other cultures. And it's a matter of finding a balance. And sometimes that, that means taking risks. And, and Huawei has done that. And as early as the you know, late 1990s, we started bringing in Western consultants. Um, you know, major consulting firms to help us sort of re-engineer the company and, 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 and the processes to make us recognizable to a non-Chinese company. And, uh, you know, everything from hiring practices to logistics. And then throughout the 2000s, we've been bringing in more and more non-Chinese folks with experience in different markets, folks with experience in different industries, um, with different competencies, we now have oh, between, somewhere between 25 and 30,000 of the employees in the company that are non-Chinese. Mm -hmm. And you start seeing more of, I mean, it's, it's, it's a win-win for the company and for the employees because we're starting to see this blend of skills and experience right. that has created a very unique company, which is a multinational company with a heritage in China. There should be more human interaction between the two governments and, and, and there should be more opportunities for you know, the perceptions that people here on Capitol Hill have of China may not have any relationship to reality. And, and if you dropped them down in the middle of Shanghai, they would, I mean, this, they'd be shocked because the perceptions that they have of China is of a China 30 years ago. But similarly, I think that in China, the perceptions of Americans as you know, cowboys are also a bit dated. When we spend time together, we realize that our perceptions are not always accurate. And I think everyone would benefit from a reconfiguration of their perceptions and that's going to require human interaction. We don't know if the cybersecurity issue will be solved anytime soon. What we do know, however, is that Huawei will keep doing business in the US, the US and China will keep doing business with each other, and this relationship benefits global development. Perhaps it would be better for both parties to spend more time talking with the people on the other side, understanding each other, and working together to find common solutions to shared problems. I'm Andy Liu in Washington, D.C. Thank you for watching this episode of China Open Mind.